Hey guys, welcome to the shop. Now, this is going to be just a real quick video, more of a recap. Uh, I haven't had a lot of shop time this week. Well, I finally got a surface that I'm happy with on this cylinder head on the shape. And it wasn't without a lot of trial and error and a lot of good suggestions from the comments of last week's video. Excuse me. And if you haven't watched last week's video, make sure to go do that because it's got a, you know, it's got a lot of good information in it in, of my first attempts. Well, I finally found a cutter that works really well on this surface and it's just an eighth inch radius. Eighth inch radius, ground in a fashion that, that keeps the cutting edge strong because this material is pretty abrasive really. And I cut this entire surface with this cutter and I can't even tell actually that I, that I used it. It held up really well. This is a piece of uh, Vasco Supreme which is a really abrasion resistant tool steel, but uh, it held up really well. Carbide may also work in a situation like this, but on the shaper, carbide's questionable. Uh, you can use braised carbide, it seems to hold up much better than inserts, but it's always an interrupted cut for the shaper, so carbide doesn't always work that well. There are situations where it does. This tool steel seemed to hold up really well. If you notice, there's a piece of leather attached to this piece of tool steel just with a little C-clamp. Now this was a comment from last week's video. One of my commenters suggested that I strap a piece of leather to the bottom of the tool. That way the tool runs over, flips back, and then it protects it on the return strip. This thing has to go back and return to make another cut. It only cuts on the forward stroke and on the back it'll drag it over the surface if it's not shielded. And what this done is two things. It shielded the surface from the cutter on the return stroke but it also cleared all the chips out of the way which ended up in a really nice finish. Uh, and I'm really happy about that. Uh, I had seen people do this in the past but I never tried it, but I'm glad that I did, and I thank the commenter who suggested this. Um, it really, it really does work. I tried plastic like a credit card, and it didn't work too well. It didn't hold up very long. So it wasn't, you know, 15 strokes. It had already worn through the piece of plastic, and, you know, wasn't helping anything. But the leather seems to hold up really well. Here's the cutter that I used in last week's video. And it's probably, uh, I don't know, an eighth inch, eighth inch radius with quite a bit of relief on the bottom. More relief than it really needs and some rake. And the cutting edge of it, by the time I was done cutting, had uh, braided and it had affected the surface finish. Another thing from last week's video that I really learned that I'm really, in my opinion, one of the most important things for me as far as this machine is that if you watch last week's video, I had a line develop in the surface. And I couldn't figure out what caused that line. It really, you know, baffled me because I didn't do anything. All I did was stop the machine, change camera angles, check my cutter to see if it was sharp, and start it back up. And after I started it back up, I had a line develop in the surface. And uh, I didn't change any of the settings on the shaper, nothing. And, uh, well, I laid in bed for two nights, and I think I finally found out what caused it. And it's fairly complicated what caused it, but uh, I'm going to try to explain it to you as best as I can. Hopefully you'll get it, but uh, I'm really glad that I found it. And uh, it had stumped me in the past, but I think I finally found out what it was. So I'm going to bring you around here get you a better uh, view of this compound. 
get set up and show you what caused the line to develop in the surface. Plus I want to show you this surface a little closer and uh, talk about it because it's a satisfactory surface that I'm pretty happy with and that I think that if I ever have to do this in the future, I'll use a cutter like this and a setup like this. So let me bring you around we'll talk about the compound and the surface. All right, here's the surface. And you can see it has a lot of little pot marks in it, and it's just where it's cast material. A lot of uh, discoloration, and I think that's just mostly in the material. Uh, it's not from the cutter. You can't feel any. Really, it feels like a piece of glass. But uh, you can see slight step over lines. This was ten thousandths of an inch all with this cutter here. Just a small radius. You can see it's got very little, very little relief and the cutting edge held up really well and done this whole surface and I can't even, like I said, can't even tell that, uh, that I used it. Here's the little better look at the cutter from last week. And you won't be able to see it probably, but the uh, cutting edge is abraded. Because <clears throat> this is, you know, cast material. There's a lot of impurities and stuff in it that are pretty hard, so. But I'm happy with this surface. It's, in my opinion, more than satisfactory, and I think would work really good. Now let me get set up, and I'll show you what I think caused the line to develop in this surface from last week. Now I'm just going to set up a surface gauge here, right below this compound. Now when I set this compound up, and I zero it, bring it down, let the cutter, you know, touch the surface, I zero. Lock the gib. Well, this thing's pretty tight. The gib in this is tight for a reason because it's held vertically. I don't want it just sliding. It has seven thousandths of an inch backlash in the screw, so I keep it fairly snug. Well, if I put a, if I put this tense indicator under this. I zero it. What I did last week is I stopped the machine, raised, changed camera angles, raised the clapper, inspected the cutter, and I dropped it. Well, what it is, what's caught, what caused that line is where this is tight, and I'm, you know, working down on one side of the screw. I'm actually preloading this. So right now it has pressure pushing downward. The only thing keeping it from moving downward is the gib, is the friction of the gib. And I lock it, you know, and you would think that that would be sufficient. Well, it's not. The sharp snap of that clapper from me inspecting that tool jarred this just enough to where it moves down. It sounds like a fairly simple thing, but uh, really, it wasn't easy to find. Because uh, it would only happen periodically, um, and, you know, my zero never moved. I never moved the table up or anything. It was not obvious what was causing it, so that's what it is. This is preloaded down. I'm working on one side of the screw. It's tight. I lock it and you assume that it's solid. Well, the sharp snap of the clapper breaks the friction between the, the gib and the lock, or between the gib and the compound, and it, because this is preloaded down, the shock moves it down just slightly. That caused my line in the surface, and uh, I'm gonna have to remedy that. I would really love to do a ball screw conversion here to eliminate the backlash, or as much backlash as possible and put a readout on my compound. Because this is your primary, you know, uh, references to the material you want to remove on a shaper, it's really critical that this compound be accurate and yet you can rely on it and you have a technique or a method uh, that is reliable and repeatable when you use it. So I'm going to set up, I think, a uh, digital readout on this, just probably uh, one of the uh, you know, shop-made deals with a, 
a nice digital caliper or something here uh, like you would use on the quill or the Miller machine. I think that would be really handy because that would tell you if your compound moves or not. Uh, so yeah, I was pretty uh, uh, happy to find that and that had caused me a lot of grief in the past. So let me show you some of the cutting footage that I cut this head with and, uh, and we'll call it good.